Hello, everyone. Uh, can everyone hear me? Uh, welcome to this week's Popular Science Lecture. Uh, it's been, uh, unfortunately, announced in Swedish, but it's going to be in English. Uh, so we apologize for that. Uh, before I hand over to Susanne, uh, I would like to say a few things. First of all, there are two emergency exits in case of an emergency. One is there and one is over there. Uh, and as you can see, this lecture is being filmed. So if you have a problem with uh, being filmed, please just uh, sit to the sides or in the back. Uh, and it would be great if you could wait with the questions until the end. And then I can hand this microphone around so your questions can be recorded as well as the answers. Great, so now I'd like to welcome uh, Susanne Nilsson from the School of Industrial Engineering and Management, who's here to talk about innovation research. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you, and thank you for inviting me to this seminar, and thank you for joining me uh, during this lunch. So my name is Susanne Nilsson, and I'm a devoted researcher in the area of innovation management, and I'm going to explain and describe in this uh, seminar why it is so crucial for all our organizations to build what we refer to as an innovation capability. We are today described as living in the fourth industrial revolution. This means that this is the fourth time that our industrial companies are facing huge challenges in terms of change and uh, opportunities and threats, because the first, the first industrial revolution was back in the mid of the 1900s, driven by the STEM engine. And then we had the mass production model coming 50, 60 years later. And in the 70s, we had a revolution that was driven by the first automatization drive, the wave. And now, this fourth industrial revolution is driven or fueled by a number of new technologies, mainly a lot of them in digital, referred to as digital technologies. And there are a vast number of examples of what these technologies can have an impact on when it comes to our firms, our industrial companies, in terms of how we develop products, how we process them or manufacturing them, how we sell them, how we distribute them, etc. These technologies refer to sometimes as uh, building cyber physical systems. We have sensors, we have big data, we have cloud to cloud. We have a number of um, uh, tools referred to as additive manufacturing, etc. So all these types of technologies can have a real huge impact on all processes for our firms. And we refer to these technologies as disruptive technologies because every time we have seen in the past, and as we are seeing right now, these new technologies also have all this potential, but they also have, uh, are uh, providing threats to what is existing because a lot of these technologies will disrupt the existing value chain, the existing markets, how we do things. And I think one of the most interesting or most exciting potentials with these new technologies is that they have a potential to actually provide us with much more sustainable products and much more uh, sustainable processes because they have a possibility to make our products more customized and locally produced still being profitable. So this, this is one of the, what I find, most interesting potential with these technologies. But despite them being so, uh, having all this potential, there are a lot of companies that will actually, during this transformation, during this revolution, cease to exist. We have seen it before, and we are seeing it uh, even more today. This is uh, an illustration of the lifespan of uh, the biggest companies, US publicly traded companies. And as you can see, the, the lifespan of a company has, has decreased from about 60 years in, in average to below 20 years today. 
So this is a huge um, change in, in how, for how long time a company is, is um, surviving or prosper. At the same time, we see also how the venture capitalists are <coughs> investing more and more money into new startup, in new tech startups. So we know for sure that a lot of the companies that we are seeing today will not, will, many of them will cease to exist and we will probably see a lot of new ones within a couple of years. But this is of course something that these mature existing companies fear. And um, you could really question yourself, why? Why are so many companies ceasing to exist? Why, why are the reasons for why these companies can't cope with these disruptive te technologies, despite all the potential? And if we look into studies, we can, we can uh, summarize these reasons to be due to that big, large companies, big, successful, mature companies, have huge problem in reacting quickly enough on the opportunity that these new technologies are providing. And one reason is because the, the companies, the people in the companies, the managers in the companies, they have really struggled to questioning their existing business models or the six existing offers and products and services, particularly if they are successful. And the business model, you could describe it as the kind of core strategy for how a, a company makes a profit, how it delivers value, how it appropriate value. So this is one thing that is really problematic. The other is as a problem or reason for why a company will, will fail to cope with disruptive technologies is because even if they find and have ident identified new business models that they need to change to, they don't dare to. Because um, replacing existing uh, successful products and, and huge profit margins is hard particularly when you change to potentially much, much less profitable business model, because that is usually the case in the beginning when you're dealing with new technologies. And finally, one uh, sec uh, third reason is because companies neglect to dedicate enough or sufficient resources to explore all the new potentials, all the new opportunities that these technologies offer. So the reasons for, for companies um, not being able to take advantage of new technologies are not based in that they don't understand the technology or don't know about it. It's because they, they do not act upon that these technologies exist or emerging. So I just put in this, instead of the survival of the fittest, it's actually about survival of the self-destructive, because this is a painful process for all these organizations. So what is the solution then? In studies where you have looked into why certain companies are surviving, why, com why some companies are surviving and others not, there are some differences. And the difference is that these companies that do survive, they are able to act upon those things that the others are struggling with. They, they do questioning their business models. They are daring to change. They invest money, people, time in new opportunities. And this is, <clears throat> they do this by combining certain organizational structures by defining a certain management support and creating a culture and ways of working where employees are continuously questioning the existing, how we think, how we do things, and also equip them with the possibility to realize radically new innovations, new offers to the market. And this is what we, in our field, refer to as, as having an innovation capability to having things like this in place. Now, if we know this, why aren't companies doing it anyway? Well, if we try to decompose, try to break up and look into what is really innovation capability, you could see it 
it is a lot of different elements that are interrelated and interacting in order for this uh, capacity to, to develop and emerge. So, um, you need to think about how to uh, develop the certain skills and competence in your workforce, how to create an, 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 uh, motivation to really persist and, and act and question things that we, do, that we discussed further. And, and the same is true for how you set up your projects, your groups, your teams. How do we create the values and norms so that people actually are uh, uh, working with new opportunities and trying to see also what's, what's behind the existing today? And of course, there's a lot of tools and ways of, of working that you need to, to also um, develop. On an organizational level, you also need to have routines, how you do things regularly, how you structure your different functions, the incentives you have. Uh, the same is true for the management and leadership. You, you need to have uh, a leadership and management that is also trying to, to, that is encouraging people to work on new opportunities to really see um, and dare to, to be challenged themselves. And it's not enough to just do changes inside your organization. You also have to consider how you collaborate with others, how you work with your customers, how you uh, find partners that have competences that, is, is, um, that you need for a certain offer, for instance. How do, you, you, how do you work with different stakeholders in the environment? So you're not alone, and, and particularly, I would say, not today, when we have these technologies that really binds us in, in different matters. We re the companies are really trying to collaborate to find how they can create value out of new technologies together. So there, there is quite a lot of elements and a lot of things that you need to consider. So it's, it's not that hard to understand why it's not an easy task for many of the companies. When it comes to uh, research in this area, this has been actually a formal research area since the 50s. Uh, and, and from start and for many years, the research was performed inside large R&D-based, uh, heavy companies, technology companies, which meant that we, uh, the, 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 the uh, innovation management was really focused on, on understanding how specific departments, research and development departments, are working with creating innovations from technologies. Over the year, though, there has been a radical quite a radical shift. So you do not consider innovations only to be about having a new technology and package it and sell it. But actually, how do you do new services? How do you uh, create completely new processes, new ways of organizing, um, completely new ways of distributing and, and capture value, for instance? So we have a much more inclusive definition of innovation today than we had earlier. <clears throat> I have a colleague of mine, Magnus Carlsson. Uh, he has done an illustration also what is actually happened with innovation management in practice. He, 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 does, this, he does this illustration to show oh, um, that management is also a profession that is a, is a, is a role that is professionalized over the years. And if we look in the 50s, people started to organize their efforts in projects. And then we be, project management became a type of management that, that from the beginning, people did in different ways. They had different ways of organizing and, and tools to use, etc. But over time, and this is what these curves are describing, over time, there became a more dominant design or more a standardized way of doing things because you learned. You learned from each other. And there also became separate roles. So today, we all it's, it's completely uh, 
normal for us to have project leaders, pro, uh, pro, project managers, etc. The same is true for quality management in the 80s. It started also as people working with different, on different ways and, and from different perspectives. And over the years, specific roles came about, specific organizations, methods, etc. Uh, and now we see the same thing for innovation management. We see how the many, many more organizations are having specific roles, specific groups, with, with the title of innovation management or innovation chief, innovation coaches, etc. So we also see some kind of professionalization on this type of management. Now, we, we know quite a lot then from research. There is, is quite a lot of research performed on what is enabling or stimulating innovation. And if we look from an organization perspective, we know that we need to create certain structures that support creativity, how you combine things to create something new, and knowledge sharing. Because innovation, the innovation process is, to a large extent, a knowledge creating process with people involved. So it's a social process in that sense. So you really need to create different means, different ways, how that so people from very different functions with different competencies meet and share knowledge to come up with new things. So there is a lot of knowledge on, on how you could really support that. The other thing is that you know from research that you need to have some kind of support. You need to have some kind of structure, processes, guidelines. These guidelines or, or processes and, and, and structures, they need, however, not to be too tight, not to be too formal, too detailed. But you need to have it. When it comes to ways of working, there's a lot of methods or, or, or uh, uh, tools that you could use to to uh, go through the whole process from understanding what your customer really needs to uh, realizing and, and launching new products. So there are a lot of different knowledge about different ways to do that. And finally, you know that you need a culture with certain element. You need a culture where you encourage things like having a courage, uh, being persistent and to continuously learn. Because one thing that is really hard, particularly when it comes to, to more radical innovation, is that it doesn't happen so often. So you need to learn from something that happens very seldom. So how do you create that learning? These are really important things. And when it comes to having this kind of culture where you actually are allowed to question things, and, and, and um, also allowed to test and experiment. You need to support people to try out things, but they not, will not uh, oh, um, succeed every time. So you need to have some kind of acceptance for failures. And this is really hard because all of our organizations are over time really um, organized for being more efficient, being uh, less um, having less errors and less variances. And now, we, when it comes to trying to do new things, you need to be on the opposite. You need to test and experiment, and you won't succeed with every time. Every time you do a test, it, it won't be successful. Uh, there are some companies, just an example, that are actually trying to do this very hard. They are trying to foster this kind of uh, culture. Uh, by having, for instance, yearly best failed ideas, Tata, an Indian company, or, or uh, Procter & Gamble, who every manager are supposed to come in and tell about the, the last year's most, um, the, the biggest failures and successes. And they need to explain what they learned from it. And we have Eli Lilly, it's, it's a pharmaceutical company. They have failure parties. Every time uh, a new study has failed, they, they have a party and they share the knowledge from these uh, latest um, results. And these, have been, these, these, these are companies that have trying to routinize, trying to do these kind of ways of working, part of the culture, to influence the culture. 
to have people try out and test more things. Now, there seem to be a lot of known, and then yet we see the numbers of uh, companies that are failing to survive. There is obviously a lot more to learn. And, and the, the truth is also that we also are, every time we come into a new period, new era, where there is a lot of new technologies emerging, there are, of course, a lot of different factors that will shift or is changed if you compare to earlier. Uh, studies and an early context. So, what we do as researchers, we, we, you, could, you could discuss this as a general design. What we are doing is, is a lot of going into different companies, different organizations, and look into how they are working with certain changes or ch uh, change activities, or looking into how they are performing their projects, improving their processes, or how are they organizing their groups and develop their teams. Um, and we also, we usually do a lot of interviews with people involved in these um, uh, efforts, as well as people that are affected, so to speak, by these initiatives, by these projects. And then we also analyze, uh, combine this with observations. Many times we are inside this organization also, could be for days to weeks. And then we do mix the interviews with some surveys, and sometimes we also do experiments to try out to see what happens if we do some typical, uh, some setting. And I will explain and give an example later. And we also look into the documents produced to see what the effects really are from different perspectives. So, and our projects are typically uh, a half, one and a half year to three years, and we are a couple of researchers in each of the projects, working close with different companies we are investigating. I will now provide you and give you a glimpse of results from some, some of the studies that I've been involved in, or are, or is involved in. Uh, and starting with my, uh, the studies that I did when I was a PhD student, just a few years ago, because I spent a lot of my professional life in industry, and then I came to KTH a couple of years ago. And when I did this study, I, I, I was interested in understanding how do companies change their routines, how they do things, this, the, their way of working, and how are they using these traditional management tools that they have in hand? How do they adapt them? How do they uh, make use of them to support also innovation? This is a picture illustrating that we <laughs> Um, we talk many times in, in innovation research about that the re, uh, different innovations have different degrees of novelty. So you have some innovations that are quite um, more about refining what you have and all the way to that you have new offers that are new to the market or are addressing new customer needs and are based on completely new technologies. So you have a range of products, usually in large organizations, you have different types of innovation, different new products in, in terms of how novel they are. So, and one strategy that a lot of companies have had in the last years is to try to involve as many people as possible in the innovation efforts. You remember that we said that one of the key, key um, uh, things that the company needs to do in order to be able to, to make the best out of potential new technologies is to allocate more resources to explore new opportunities. And this is one way, trying to have as many people as possible in the organization involved from their perspective to improve things or meet and identify completely new products and offers. And <clears throat> from a, a theoretical point of view, orga routines are ways of working, basically, that you do recurrently. And that is kind of, after a while, part of the normal operations. And I was kind of interested in how they tried to develop these kind of routines in companies. So I investigated two, two large, successful companies, one in the medtech and one in the telecom industry to see how they did it. And also, I tried then to see, as I, as I mentioned, how they use the traditional management tools. And in, in, from a theoretical point of view, you could 
you could divide the different management tools that you have available into three basic categories. You could either work directly with per people, individuals, by supplying cha uh, training opportunities or, or encouraging certain values and norms and, and um, provide time and money for innovation, for instance. And then you could also use tools like defining a process, setting up rules, um, developing certain methods, etc. And you can use what is referred to as result controls, basically setting up specific goals with things on an individual level, on a team level, or as a whole organization. So these are a, a way of grouping different kind of managers, management tools to steer behaviors in an organization. This is a typical way of trying to condense a lot of data. Because when you go out, and as I did, I went out to these companies, I visited units and I interviewed a lot of people trying to get a document and to see how they, what they did in order to support innovation. And we, I won't go through this in detail, but basically I could see that they had different types of, of uh, approaches or strategies you had uh, one unit that were really focused on trying to have certain um, days where everyone was gathered and, 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 and did idea generation. And, and um, you had also a, a specific roles and a board that tried to come up and design these days. Um, and then you had another unit that really didn't have any types of formal structure, but instead they allowed everyone to spend 10 to 20% of their working hours to dedicate it to explore new opportunities. And then you had another unit that also had certain uh, um, uh, specific days, but they combined it with also have uh, developing coaching roles and weekly meetings. And they were out, these coaches were out in organizations supporting people that also had a limited uh, time period, uh, um, working hours. And then finally, uh, the unit here you can see described had only uh, one routine, or a couple of routines, but one routine where everyone was invited to come up and show their ideas to the management board. And they together developed these ideas. And, and they were allowed to come back and back and back if they got no, <laughs> if they developed the idea further. And then they also had a specific group of senior engineers that were developing some of these ideas. So these are just briefly, so this is one way to illustrate how different organizations can try to foster uh, new routines. These are two uh, quotes from two different individuals working in one of the companies, two individuals that are very good at, both of them very good at coming up with new ideas, supporting teams to develop new innovations. And they, if you just read it a bit, you can see that these different individuals, they have very different needs when it comes to control or steering or, or, or management um, behaviors. One really just want to have the time available and the other want to have specific areas and specific problems that she should invest her time in. Both successful. And this implies then that when it comes to what routines and how to steer this is really about finding and trying to balancing a lot of things. So what I did is, is kind of identifying how you could balance different types and combine different managerial controls and also some routines that were specifically, that emerged was specifically important. And one of them was having some kind of meetings with the innovators where you evaluated and developed the idea and have resources bounded to that and not only having routines for generating and stimulating idea generation because we saw that in those companies that that had a strong focus only on idea generation and didn't have so much of routines in in later stages they failed to create a high engagement and didn't 
receive, and over the years they receive less and less good ideas. And the same is true when it comes to how you combine different controls that you really need to balance, because what we saw is in one, a couple of the units in, in both companies, some provided no tools, no support at all, but the time. But what happened is that even if people got the time, they didn't know what to do with the time. And the other projects that really had clear deadlines and, and, and people who were asking for things to be ready, they took over this time as well. So you really need to balance the different types of controls that you use. And one thing that we saw when we, we went into this, in this first study is that as I mentioned, we need to have a good routine for how we select and dedicate resources to develop ideas, not only to encourage the idea to come. And in another project that was funded a couple of years later, um, we investigated five different companies and how they performed in terms of developing their innovation capability. And inside that project, we also designed an experiment where we actually had management boards and people from different functions evaluating a bunch of new ideas that were different in terms of how incremental they were or how radically novel they were. And then they had to select them and they had to prioritize them among these ideas. And first we asked them to do it individually and then we asked them to do it in groups. And then we saw the differences. And it's kind of interesting that in all groups, the most uncertain ideas were downplayed compared to the certain ideas. And almost always, the incremental ideas were much more favored when you came to uh, the group discussion compared to an individual prioritization. So in, on an individual level, we are more prone to say yes to more radical new ideas. But when we get together in the group, it tends to be downplayed for a lot of reasons. And one of the reasons was also due to how these processes, how these discussions were made. So we saw that it could really differ the type of group processes. So basically from this experiment, we suggested to have an idea selection process where you both individually prioritize and in the team. And because what we saw is that if we do the prioritization individually, we could actually, from the differences, how people rank the different ideas individually, we could see which ideas were the most uncertain. And those uncertain ideas, you could have a discussion in the group, but with some formal criteria also around it, in order not to downplay it immediately. And um, this is interesting because we've done the same experiment or we modified it and did it with students and we do it actually yearly from now, a couple of years ago. And, and we see they, they also get this experience of trying to what happens to me when I do things individually and when I come in a group and what happens with my biases, my preferences. Things that we believe are really important when you come out and should be challenging things and, and really uh, develop something new. These are studies where we have been inside companies and studying how they develop routines and, and ways of working internally. But companies are also increasingly interested in, in understanding how to collaborate, not the least with small companies, small startups. So this is uh, just a glimpse from an ongoing study with a PhD student on a big German OEM, automotive OEM, where they are trying to, to develop different routines or different ways of working, whether engineers are collaborating with startups in different ways. And they found that it's, it's both some of these collaboration modes is, is really helpful in terms of also making the, the individuals involved more explorative, more innovative, getting the motivation. And also um, some of, of these uh, ways of working are also encouraging the networking and the collaboration. And, and so this is an ongoing study to see what, what actually happens when big companies work together with small and what are the challenges and what are the opportunities. As, as maybe uh, clear from now, it's like that we have dealing 
when dealing with innovation is, is to a lot of extent to dealing with increased levels of uncertainties. And this is also a quotation from an engineer describing how this level of uncertainties has increased tremendously over the years. And one of the reasons is that the product development cycle is going faster and faster, which makes the uncertainties when you change something in one product and then it will affect many others. And this in combination with that, the way of working, the processes that they are using are old. And they are, instead of trying to find new ways, they are still very clinging on to their checklist and how to do things rather than trying to find new ways of working. And this is actually a problem that you have a development process that's going faster and faster and you haven't had the time to update your processes, your documentation. And what we found is, of course, that these uncertainties that you have to deal with, they're stemming from different sources, both from the technology themselves, but also because you don't know the market, you, know, don't, you don't know the business, the value the customer needs with completely new technologies. And the organizational is becoming more and more complex because you need to collaborate from different functions. So we studied some of the tools that the engineers are using. So we get, went into depth with some of them to see uh, what, what, what they found was useful. And, and um, you might be aware of, but in, 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 as an engineer, we are very drilled in, in doing risk analysis and taking care of the technical risks. But when it comes to estimating how fast things will evolve and how you, uh, when you could deliver something, uh, those kind of estimates are quite much harder. And one way that they have found was something that they called ranges. This is the last one here. And, and basically what that is, that they are trying, instead of saying that we will complete this new product, this date, they say it will be in a range in a couple of weeks. And then they try to estimate and follow the, de the development. So instead of saying a certain date, they're trying to, to use a range and then estimate it. The knowledge gap process is another way of trying to encourage people to not say that we are not only talking about technical risks, but we are trying to gather all the gaps we have in knowledge right now to see how we could do in order to, 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 to fill this gap and have a product that is more reliable in the end. And what we found in this research was that we have three competences that we found was really crucial. And, and one is, is understanding how to combine the waterfall, the planning, the traditional way of planning projects with a more new one, a more agile one, and how you do it, because it's neither of. It's not neither of. You have to use both. You also have to be more um, knowledgeable in understanding business value when you scope the different uh, projects for different teams. And finally, it's not that transparency of uncertainties will solve everything, rather the opposite. Sometimes you need to hide certain uncertainties <laughs> for some people in order for them to, to work and then other people take care of other uncertainties. So this is also a competence that you need when you have such a huge level of uncertainties available. And finally, uh, a project that is just finalized, we were, dis we were investigating uh, how companies dealt with radical innovation, realizing radical innovations. And, and if you, you, you could describe it, we, we went into and, 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 and looked into a number of uh, radical innovation projects and how they have emerged over time. And you could say that in the early phase, these ideas, the, the, what is characterizing them is that the ideas are really hard to understand or believe in, and they do not seldom provoke in an organization. And, and in, during the development, they rarely fit into existing processes and structures. So you need to really have other ways of working with them. And finally, when you launch them, even when you launch the new idea, you're not, you're, you do not know actually how it will be received in the market. And, and, and um, it's, it's, so, so, so you have to work with the customers, with the product, all the way beyond the launch. 
and we found that there were three groups of mechanisms that really were supportive, and, and that was actions and tools that were supporting to really educate what the idea was about in terms of visualization prototypes. And you had to use different types of visualizations and prototypes for different people in the organization. And also, you had to take a lot of actions to spread the idea, to create trust in it. And for, for many of the people involved in this progress, they found this was really tiresome. But we were also discussing that this is also important. This, this is necessary to do. And finally, when we come to the managing uh, the, uh, new competence shift that the disruptions really are giving rise to, we have to consider what happens to the competences that we have today and how people working with technologies that are the base for the company today and when it be becomes extinct or less valuable, how should we do this competence shift? So we have, in, a, in an ongoing study, we are looking into how you could deal with managing the diff when you have increased diversity in terms of competences. How do you manage this in a good way in order for you to be able to make the best out of it? And when it comes to diversity, there's a lot of different dimensions. So we have just finalized a pre-study in, in a big global OEM where we looked into how the different groups were diverse in terms of a lot of different dimensions. And we also investigated what kind of practices and mechanisms they had in order for people in their organizations to feel included. And feeling included is both, both about feeling that you are appreciated for unique competence and personality, as well as feeling belonged to the team. And what we found is that, of course, there is an increase in diversity. And um, you could see that different groups, depending on the proximity to the new technologies, how close they were and how they, much they had to deal with it, that there were different challenges rising. And, and there is a need for new recruiting, new onboarding, new group development tools that really spurs and take the best and advantage of this increased diversity. And we believe that one of the best things is to creating an inclusive environment, which does not mean that you have a very nice environment, but actually an environment where people are challenging each other, but still feel that they are valued and safe to do so and we will continue. Our research have implications also beyond industry. We just recently finalized a one-year program with a lot of people from different public authorities, uh, because also the public organizations need to develop their innovation capability. And I would say that this knowledge that we have and this awareness of what we are needing in our organization also have implications for KTH, for education. We need to develop the skills in our students, not only the technical competences, but also that make sure that you as students have a better understanding of how you create value from new technologies. And that, you are, that we are fostering you to have the courage to challenge the existing things of doing and have the persisting persistence to, to uh, develop these radically new business models. And that, that's why we believe it's so important to also exposure you as students in, in, in um, more open-ended projects where you're exposed to these high levels of uncertainties and diversity in order to be trained for what is happily you are going to face when you come out to this organization, and for you to be as helpful as possible. And as I mentioned before, I mean, one of the most exciting potentials with these new technologies, being in this fourth industrial revolution, is the potential that these technologies have in order to make more sustainable uh, products and services. And we have a really interesting in initiative at KJ called the Global Development Hub. And if you haven't heard about it, please check it up. 
because this is an initiative that where KTH is taking the lead to integrate new educational models where we are dealing with more global challenges into the engineering curriculum. And for you who are teachers, there is a recently developed teaching course if you're interested to learn how you could make projects that are more open-ended, dealing with these challenges within your um, area of research and, and education. Because we know, as, as engineers, that none of the potential will be realized automatically. It's we who are there. We need to support what direction our new technologies will go at. That's why we need to also in involve education and students in this effort. Thank you. Great. So, is this on? Uh, running a bit late, but if anyone has a question, I think we have time for one. Everything. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Hi. Hi. I just had a question when you were talking about the experiment that you did on the uh, one prioritizing the, yes, the new ideas. Yes. Yes. Exactly. That you said that the best option would be to combine individual and group mm -hmm. practice. Mm -hmm. Then I was just wondering, because you said that you'd take the most uncertain and discuss those using certain mm -hmm. criteria or mm -hmm. certain mm -hmm. kind of like a frame. Yeah. What would that, like, do you have an example yeah. of what that yeah. would be? Yeah, because what we saw is that uh, we found that, that many of these companies, they didn't have clear innovation goals. So what they were, uh, they didn't have that, and if they didn't have clear ideas on what type of innovations they would like, in what areas, or what problems they would like to solve, then these criteria couldn't, these goal or these uh, directions couldn't be used when they selected ideas. But when we had them to also discuss, you know, what kind of goals they should have, then it really supported the, the, uh, these more uncertain ideas because they were they could fit more or less than in certain strategic directions. Yeah, thank you. Oops. Lovely, so I'd like to say thank you to Susanne Nilsson for coming here today. This oh, is a little you. present from the library. And I'd like to remind everyone else that there's gonna be another lecture in two weeks time. It's gonna be Andrea Sarcenti, who's gonna be talking about precision engineering. Uh, it's gonna be filmed here and live streamed to uh, Campus of the Telia. So I hope to see you there. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you. Thank you.